This video is something like a reverse guide. It's a gorilla attack that results in learning. G-U-E, gorilla. And maybe you don't hate digital painting, it's that you're sort of intimidated by it. You're so used to using a fine line that comes with a pencil or ink brush that using more vague shapes is kind of daunting and impossible to really wrap your head around. I'm using Procreate on the iPad as usual, but you can use any digital art app. These are tools that are universal to them. This video started as a three hour stream from Wednesday of Lightbox Expo last week that I've edited down to the format that you see now. By the time that the stream was over, we got through a certain portion of the character rendering wise and then I finished the rest which you'll see in a time lapse at the end. We had such an incredible time this year at Lightbox streaming for six days in a row interacting with you guys. We really sincerely appreciate all of the support and hello to new people as well. The sale that we usually do through the virtual booth is obviously over at this point, but you can still get my first digital art book called Character Compendium. It's brand new. It's 60 pages. It's a place where I've compiled all of the characters and stories and things that I've talked about over the years on this channel, sort of scattered around all over the place, given them some more thorough explanation and thought and a little bit more of the context of what's going on with these stories. It's a lot of fun, and I really appreciate the support. That you guys have given it so far. And of course, we've got a new Bigos backpack for September with Entag, the graffiti loving robot, as our foil trading card, and Jonadab as our hard enamel pin. You can get that at patreon.com slash babeldenizen at the Bigos backpack tier. Enjoy how to paint characters for people who hate painting. Here's the thing with this. There are drawbacks to this. There are cons to the process that I'm going to show here. And really what I I'm thinking of this as is a bridge in understanding for someone who's coming from a certain side of art to another. Um, I don't know if it's a cheat necessarily because if you're still kind of doing all of the work, you're just doing it in kind of a backwards way, right? So if you're like me, you draw with pencil, you draw with ink, right? You're like, Oh, I'm gonna draw my pencil and then I'm gonna do what a comic artist does and I'm gonna lay my inks over top of that and then it'll be done, right? Does that make sense? But when you're painting, painting is a much, like at least as far as how it looks when someone else is painting, it looks like this, right? Where they're like, hey, look, I'm, I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna paint a face. And they just, they do like something like this and they're like, yeah, that's the face and I'll finish it up later. At my mind, I look at that and I'm like, what? You're just gonna, and then they start, you know, they, they come in, and this is a purely legit, you know, it sounds like I'm making fun of it. This is a legitimate means by which people do this, right? But they come in and they start like sort of refining it down and everything. I can't, I'm starting to be able to handle this kind of painting, but to get here took what I want to share, right? This, this process. So we're gonna trick your brain. We're gonna trick your brain into painting today, starting with a sketch and starting with ink. One drawback of painting versus comic art and stuff like that is that it obviously takes a lot more time. But a lot of times we want to create something that looks like really flashy and finished, right? I'm thinking of, you know, sometimes a, even on like box art for a, a toy or definitely box art for a game, right? The, the contrast there, you want some splash art or something larger than what you normally put in, right? Um, so that's the kind of the finished goal here. Maybe this could be like the, the cover art for your comic. You know, you don't want to have such a huge discrepancy between the exterior and interior that it's almost like false advertising. But everyone knows that you kind of put a little more work into the cover to grab some attention and you put your best foot forward, right? So that's, that's what we're going to do. I am not going to give him uh, an environment. I'm just gonna render him kind of on the spot, but we do need to eventually start thinking about lighting. This is the main difference between drawing and painting, is that with drawing, you can get away with separating objects and shapes with lines. Lines, as we've talked about, aren't real. Um, and black lines especially are so uh, abstract a concept in real life that it's just something that we sort of use as a shorthand to go like, hey, that shape is done, we're moving on to another shape, right? We're, we're going, hey, the ear is done, and now it's just blank space. Otherwise, you would need to actually show the lighting condition, right? But, you know, there's there's not really such thing as, as lines, and so eventually by the end of this, 
we shouldn't have any lines. It's we're gonna kind of approach it like a comic rendering process and then slowly take away the lines and replace them with light. So we don't want to just hand wave with shapes, and maybe you've done this before in your drawings before where you're like, I don't really know what that object is or what it is I'm really drawing, but if I just kind of, you know, add a little detail here, it'll be fine, right? So like if I did something like this, right? It just, it's nonsense. Like it is a line and maybe you're saying, oh, well, the color over here is like, you know, different than over there but it doesn't, it doesn't actually follow the constructed contour of this ear, right? So we need to kind of have a mental understanding of what's going on in here. Almost like a, you know, a grid pattern. At least as far as our shapes are concerned, but then also later on when we're doing our lighting. What I appreciate, what I enjoy about this part of the process, like I'll say again, this is probably not the fastest way to do this if you already have a good painting understanding, but it's kind of like almost training or kind of foolproof if you're not sure. Um, but what I do appreciate about this is that it's a portion of my work where kind of like yesterday is all problem solving and design decisions and stuff like that. Inking is a fairly tedious, but like mentally light mechanical process. Anytime you ink, you're gonna sterilize somehow. You're gonna make some, you're gonna make it less good than the sketch. We actually could start with just the sketch that we already had. And some people will do that. There's a couple of things that there's kind of like a, a lineless art kind of hack that I haven't showed off before that I'd like to show. Um, and you can sort of stop in our process at lineless art slash, you know, uh, there's a couple of lines where you need them, where shapes of the same color are intersecting. And by the end of this, we will just be straight up painting. Uh, but the way that we got there uh, has all of the visual information that we need. A lot of times when someone starts painting or they do digital painting or they do kind of like what we were doing before with just this right of just like yeah I'm, I'm painting in here it becomes too loose too fast there isn't enough patience to like really go in and define detail and then it actually becomes like too um too muddy The thing about this is that's better than the sketch. We could have just used the sketch, but our lines are pretty consistent. There's the edges of the lines are all smooth and consistent, right? But they're also, you know, it's a, it's a container for the color that's gonna come. And also when you're painting, painting does well with uh, clean edges as well. So if any of our lines end up being the outside of a shape when painting, we're already there and we can add sort of extra smoothness or bumpiness or texture after the fact instead of trying to clean up back from it. Again, it's sort of just like a backwards process. Now what I'm gonna do, start a new layer I'm gonna use a clipping mask. This isn't the way that everybody do, does this. Some people like to choose that silhouetted base color and click mask, and then they only use that mask in order to add color back on. It's the same principle for both. Um, I'll delete that mask. Clipping mask is just making it so any color that I draw only goes on what's already uh, opaque, right? 
so it's not going to go outside that boundary. Um, now I'm going to fill in, I'm going to use these base colors for the character. This is not how you would necessarily do it when painting, right? You wouldn't necessarily only use the local color. Local color is the color that the thing is in sort of a perfect sterile lighting environment, right? But if you look at, take like human skin, which is incredibly complex, you know, if you're inside under, you know, fluorescent lights, your your skin looks a certain way. If you get a picture taken of you with flash, it looks a certain way. If you're outside in the sunlight or in the moonlight, the skin changes color drastically all of, all of those times because it's what the surface does to the light, not just what the surface is. We're gonna pretend we're doing the same thing that you would in a comic, where you'd probably start with the local color and then you can go over top of them with layers that complicate or, or add, you know, blending and stuff on top of it. This is the part where it's it's kind of a, a hack of coloring line art. Otherwise, coloring line art is very tedious. And a lot of times the biggest issue isn't coloring the lines, but it's figuring out where one shape is ended and another begins. Because as soon as you add the same color to the edge of something, for example, if I came in here to my line art and said, oh, I'm I'm, you know, this is this is gray, and then this is also gray, well it's not because this line over here is actually this color. And that's kind of confusing, and especially because it's it's going away as soon as you color and it's blank. It, you know, all of a sudden when we, if we make it darker later or whatever, it's not the right color. We're trying to define the edge of a shape of color. So here's what I like to do. I start a new layer and I do the same thing of a clipping mask over top of the line art layer. So we aren't destroying or doing anything to our original lines you know if you wanted to you could duplicate the the lines and and put them down here and just hide them as sort of like a you know in case anything goes wrong you have a, an extra copy here's the thing you can go over top of the line this is the same thing where you you know you're going over only what's what's opaque and we can do this but a lot of times and myself included i'd go in and i'd start doing this where i you know i'm coloring it the right color it's the the color that the shape of that the line is inside, or the, the color inside the line is. But then I get all of this, right? Where I get to the edge of something, I'm like, oh, I need to figure out and define this edge there, but I don't know where like, you know, the edge of the of this shape meets back there, and then oh now I have to go back and I'm I'm like fighting back and forth, right? Here's here's what I do. Here's what you do. You go to this layer the layer that's coloring the lines, and you drop it to 90%. That's it, that's the hack, look what happens. You, you following this camera guy, you come in here, you go in, you get a nice clean edge on that gray. Now you come into here with our, our lighter gray, and you know exactly where it ends. You might have a little bit of, you know, something to fix there on the other side, and now I also know kind of despite what we were trying to avoid. There's a little bit to come back into our color layer and add to, but you're using the right color. You know, you aren't using a darker color. It's the right color. And as soon as we take this back up to 100% opacity, it's it's right, you know, barring our little artifacts in, in these little spots. But that has cut down a ton of the tedium of coloring line art for me.
so now we can duplicate our lines here and I'll go in to the, the line colors. I'll go into the hue saturation and make it a little bit darker, right? So we bring all of those those colors back, but I'll also increase the saturation because when we decrease the brightness, we also kind of suck some of that color out of it. And if we wanted to, we could actually, you know, start defining a little bit of the color environment of our lines a little bit, and maybe even change the hue. You know, if we did it extreme, that doesn't really work in either direction, but just a little bit like that. And now we're over describing it, right? Because anytime we have a line that's on the outside of a shape of color that already changes color by the time it gets over there, we don't need this line. But when we have something like this, where it's a line that is saying, hey, the you know, the, there's something changing geometrically here from the ear to the head, we keep it. So now we'll go through this process of only keeping the lines that matter. We have, we're gonna start the process of making this a painting. You can, you can stop here if you'd like, right? In your own process. Uh, what we're gonna do is take this bottom layer of color, gonna duplicate it. And I'm gonna take my line art layer and also duplicate it. I'm gonna grab the ones that are on the bottom for both, otherwise they have the layers nested underneath them. What I'm making is a mask, and this is, if someone was actually doing like, layer masking instead of nested clipping mask layers, then they probably don't have to do this process. I'm going to merge these two together. I'm going to turn the, the, the everything down, the brightness down on it, so it's just black. And now I can hide it, I can select it, and everything that I do over top of the, co the character is all gonna be done within this. So blending modes and stuff like that, I can fill in from here and very clean edges, right? I'll, I can fill in with a solid color like this. I can go in and choose something like a multiply layer, right? That's pretty standard stuff. Um, and maybe what I'll do is kind of change the color of this a little bit. Careful in Procreate, sometimes there's a little bit of a bug where um, changing the opacity of something while it's selected like changes the opacity of the layer itself. All right, I'm in my multiply layer here. I can change the opacity on this a little bit. So now this is like our shadow. And because we don't have something behind the character. We don't have him set in an environment. We're very much pretending what the lighting conditions are, but we don't want to just use pure white and pure black because that's very sterilizing, right? In most situations, we have uh, yellow or orange light, like the sun, which is very warm, with, um, you know, sort of blue or purple toned shadows as a reaction to that. We, you could have like very red light and then the, the shadows look almost green by comparison. They're sort of just contrasting colors. You'd have blue light with sort of uh, brown tan shadows from that, like weird, weird contrasting stuff like that. Um, I'm gonna pretend that we have a pretty standard like daylight setup for our, our guy here. So, it, so it's straightforward, right? We're not pretending that he's in this weird, you know, lava filled cavern with green slime that glows nearby him because it's just overcomplicated for what we need to do, right? Um, I'm gonna take our multiply layer here and it's already at a low opacity. And I can also, what I like to do before I get into like carving the light shapes out is come in here because this is what light does. It falls off in intensity and it changes color um, so I don't like to have a, a shadow layer that's purely just one color. I like to come in and, you know, color it in. I'm, I've got my layer still selected here, and I've got, like, kind of a more pinkish purple that I can come in and, and shade with. Um, I could not like that very much and go in and get a green instead. And do that. I can go a little bit darker, I think, is what I need to do so that it's just sort of a hue shift for the temperature and color of the, 
of the shadow, right? It's not gonna consistently be the same color shadow. Um, and this is also still very preliminary, right? We're still gonna do overpainting over top of this, but I think this is helpful. Just to step, get the groundwork a little bit. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. Uh, maybe some of the green too is like bounce light. So for example, he's standing on grass and the sunlight is bouncing the green up on top of him. Maybe you've kind of been that in that kind of situation before where you kind of get the green bouncing up. Sometimes on skin it does that. Now what I'm gonna do, I grab uh, something that I can cut away, carve into the shadows with to establish some amount of like the base light. And what I'm doing now, I, I've got like the Max Shader Pastel, which is a Max Eulichny brush here that I'm gonna cut into my multiply layer because when I do that, we bring back the local color. This isn't the final lighting, right? But it's it's mainly establishing, kind of like we did before with that, when we were like, oh, do we have the, you know, are we, is there a dimension to this ear or are we just cutting like a straight line through it like that? We're, we're figuring that out. We're kind of establishing, okay, there's a little bit of this ear up here. So this is, if you've kind of followed like rendering tutorials of mine in the past, this all is pretty much, this is pretty similar, but we'll divert from it a little bit in a, in a moment. So now I wanna make sure, you know, I'm thinking about, I can actually get away, get rid of my selection, which you can't see anyway. Um, and I can look at the, the lighting and think about, okay, the light's coming in from this direction, kind of like that. So that's how I'm gonna cut away my shadows, just in a preliminary way. This isn't final. Um, maybe if it was a comic or we were doing something really quick, it would be, but this is all a patience game at this point. So now we're at a point where we've got the multiply layer. It's just, we've cut volume into our, our light and that's basically it. And it's not, it's in an ugly middle ground place where this is all there is. So it's defining things, but it's not appealing by any, by any measure. Uh, maybe we cut a little bit more in over here, a little more light, but it's, it's kind of sterile because everything is the same color. Even though we've, we've added you know, that that difference in the multiply layer in hue. We still have a little, we have a ways to go. So I'm gonna come back in here and now I'm gonna maybe do one more of these sort of overlays of, of blend modes and we can just kind of look at like what looks cool. You know, immediately we get a bunch of different things that happen in here. You know, a little bit of overlay or something like that. And maybe I come in and, you know, that purple's kind of cool, but I kind of, I take what's here and I just, this is the first of a few times where I'm gonna just do a general kind of wash of something over top. So here I can kind of cut away some of that purple. Now it's a little bit more variance, but now I'm actually gonna come in with a new layer. I'm gonna select again. And now I'm going to go into my sort of standard digital painting brush. Uh, which is this this hard uh, brush, which is like for Procreate, it's in the airbrush menu for Photoshop. It's like one of the standard brushes where it's it's basically doing this, right? Where it's got, you know, it, it builds up a little bit um, and then it sort of, sort of does 
these, it's harder as you press it. And you can build up over time and people like to kind of do color picking and stuff along with that. You know, you can come in, come in with something else and sort of layer those things on, on top of them. And I also, you know, you can also come in with, let's pick our same uh, brush that we were cutting away with our eraser and use that as a smudge tool. And so anytime that we want to kind of blend our paints a little bit, you can come in sparingly with the smudge and kind of soften those lines. It's another tool where it's very easy to misuse or look kind of amateur, but when you do it right, it's, kind of, it's nice and powerful. So I'm gonna come in, and the first thing I'm gonna do is think about kind of my highlights of light. So a lot of times, or, or even in the past, I've kind of come in with you know a new layer over top and I've selected it, and now I'm gonna like take a, a bright yellow color and start you know, set it to um, overlay or, or something like hard light or add, right? And I just go like, yeah, here's my here's my highlights, right? Here's. But what I'm gonna do is instead just go completely a normal layer. This is normal. Now, I'm now over painting on top, and it's preliminary, but I'm gonna start kind of working some of this actual finished detail in and a lot of that texture as I go. Okay, so I've got a lighter color of my gray here. Um, maybe hue shifted a little bit. I don't like doing purely, you know, the same, everything in the same hue section, right? Stick with this. And at first it's very, you know, stark. So we're building away from a neutral. Kind of use that smudge to kind of blend it in a little bit. But I'm also looking at places like this and I'm starting to color pick over top. So maybe we get a little bit of a blend of that, that multiply underneath. And because there's like these little flecks of different, you know, values and hues and stuff, we can kind of mess with that a little bit. And I'm no longer, like, because this is a normal layer, I'm not, like, sometimes you can get really stuck with some of those, you know, you can get stuck with a blending mode and, like, what it does to, to it almost starts to trip you up. So I, it's nice to go back over top and, and what you see is what you get with a normal layer. You're picking actual colors and that's what you get there. Um, and I also, as I'm doing lighter colors, not afraid to add in areas where there's darker color too. Some of that ambient occlusion stuff we can work in a little bit more. Because otherwise if our shadows are all the same intensity, that's flattening things, but that's what overpaint's all about. This fur texture in more believably, there's little edges. I can take like a darker, you know, fleck of something, maybe like a little more purple and like start doing little edges of a fluff, a fluff edge going in and then I blend in the side. Does that make sense? You know, soft edge on one end, hard on the other. This is actually the part where I think a lot of times people will be making like tutorials or something and they're painting and then it like sort of crashes, it crashes, it crosses a threshold where it's like, oops, I don't, I'm not following anymore. They did some kind of magic and I don't know what they're, I don't know how to follow this. Um, but I think a lot of times this very uncomplicated overpainting is what's happening.
you can see where it start, where it ends, like hair, right? Sort of like you can see, um, even if you look at my own hair in the camera, you start to see like these, the outer bits and like kind of the, where the hair ends. You don't see where this starts, right? Like you don't see where the hair starts underneath because there's like the feathering and layering of, of hair. So the same is happening to our koala. And feel free if there's any reference that you can use for your character, even if it's a fantasy thing, if there's something it's sort of based off of or some kind of study or reference you can use, use reference. Here's something we can do with the nose. So I'm gonna deselect my selection here and I'm actually gonna use my lasso because the lasso is a really helpful tool with painting at any point. I'm gonna highlight that part there. I'm gonna pick like a really vibrant blue here. I'm gonna to go to my soft brush and I'm just gonna fill this in like that. That's gonna, how, that's gonna be how I start my nose rendering, like that a little bit. And then I'll go where it's darker, especially around this line art section, back to my hard brush and start filling in with some of that. And maybe even something a little bit like, well, something weird, like a little bit of brown kind of thrown in there. Just as some hue variation. Um, so I'm creating something that's kind of specular and, and glossy with a lot of hard edges and fall off and stuff like that, reflections almost. And up close as we're doing it, it just, there's parts of it where it's like, is this ever gonna look, is this gonna look good? I doubt it. But then you, you zoom out or you do a little bit of smudging and it looks, turns out great. That's what the nose looked like before, that's what it looks like now. We can do a little bit, we can use the same light, we can kind of bounce it in the middle. Uh, some of the stuff is gonna be intuitive, but others is gonna be the result of you doing material studies. So you're looking at the reflective surface of a car or a fruit. Those are the only two things you can study. Uh, or skin, right? And you, you see the way that the light interacts with with stuff. It's not as typical as you think it is sometimes. It's pretty fun. For the eyes, the really cool thing we can do is we can start doing like really reflective little things. We can add the, the eucalyptus is bouncing into his eye here, which is super cool. Yeah, you can do a little fleck of it over here. Uh, you can use some of the blue and like purple in his eye and kind of blend it together. Isn't that cool? The back edge, you know, of something we get little bits of like light, right? So for example, and this is something you can do at any, you know, level of detail, even with a comic art, is you can kind of, you can add a little bit here and there, sparing. Here we'll do the same. I got the iPad Pro, but didn't get the big one. I got the smaller one because I thought the bigger one might be too cumbersome. The jury's still out on whether it was a good idea or not. Um, yeah, I like the big one, but I think people who do well with smaller screen size, I just like it, you know, I like that. Big boy screen, real estate. I, I find it's like basically, you know, I was working with a Cintiq that was 22 inches before, and a lot of that screen space ends up being, you know, UI and stuff. And because Procreate is so much, um, you know, more simplistic in the UI, 
moves a lot of this, that stuff out of the way, it ends up feeling basically the same, screen size wise. There's times when I miss like the, you know, a size of Cintiq I don't, I didn't even have like 24 or 30 or something. Uh, I'm gonna tone this down. I think I made a mistake here with this blue, but I do kind of want to do something here. I'm gonna add a new layer. Here's another thing that you can do. Add a new layer, fill all of this in with a little bit of overpainting, way too much. Uh, and, you know, define the shape of light that you want, which in this case is a shadow. Take my soft brush here, cut into the edge of it so that only one part of it is, is hard, edged. And then we just drop the opacity down a bit until it's what we wanted. And then merge it down. Merge all this down. at our koala I think you know I think we just do we do the the arms with the same principles and the gloves kind of at the same principles and add some more overlays and do those things that we were talking about we don't just stop here we can keep building on top of this um, but it's not it's not too bad and I think that you know if we craft it like that that's the YouTube thumbnail if as, as it were with just a, a little more rendering in there and you can build a full environment behind them you know that's another thing is if you're gonna do the environment do that make enough of, establish enough of that as you can or as much as that as you can from the beginning don't just make up the background that gives you twice as much work after the stream here I continued using the same principles and steps to continue the rendering on the rest of the body and I'm pretty happy with the way that this turned out as a standalone rendered character with just a little bit more polish than you'd usually get from a traditional comic process. A question for you in the comments below, especially if you've gotten to this point in the video, what is it that's most intimidating to you about digital painting or rendering or polishing, finishing your art and character design work? I'd love to hear what pain points there are or things that hold you back. I'd love to revisit the subject matter, especially in those places that concern you guys, the things intimidating you. And I'd love to revisit Klobs the Koala here and his partner in crime, Wombat. You can follow me at Bagel Denizen on Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, and TikTok. And of course, subscribe here for new videos every week on Character Design Forge. Thank you so much for watching and have fun creating.